Thank you. So now, after this side event in which everybody is here, so it's not really a side event, it looks like more like a session, um, we are going to go on. And um, we have been looking yesterday, as you may remember, about policy and government action. On the Nexus, Nexus we have also looked at the industry partnerships. We have looked at the energy sector and how is Know, reaching out also to the water sector. This morning we look at the view of the companies and not only of the water companies and not only of the energy companies and of the local authorities. And now what is left is really the research and the academic community, what they have to tell us about um, and the science community, what they have to tell us about uh, the, the partnerships that they are promoting and they are implementing. In order to do that, we have two panels, as I said this morning. Uh, the first panel is uh, moderated by Safar Adil, who is the director of the United Nations University Institute for Water, Health and Environment. Is that correct? And um, the second panel is uh, being organized by the World Water Assessment Program, and it will follow after the coffee break. So, Adil, I take it that you will present your panelists. Thank you very much. Yes, I will. Uh, thank you very much, Josefina, for the kind introduction. So, uh, as you can sense, uh, we're going to change gears a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. So, while we're changing gears, we're still sitting inside the same car, uh, which is this water energy nexus. But what I mean by changing gears is that we're going to look at uh, some of the research questions which uh, uh, we thought were, were coming up. And... Actually, the presentations in the last two and a half days have actually uh, reinforced in a way that the, those questions indeed are, are the ones that still need to be answered. So we have a panel here which is going to bring in some very interesting and diverse perspectives on the issue. We're also going to change gears a little bit in terms of how we conduct this panel, and we would like it to be very interactive. Uh, and in fact, other than my introductory presentation and maybe a few slides uh, that uh, one of our colleagues will use, we don't have set presentations. I've asked each of the panelists to uh, give their remarks along a set of fixed questions, uh, and we will basically like to engage you in a, in a conversation uh, more than us giving you a presentation, because we're really trying to drive at what are the research questions that eventually we need to answer. For us at the uh, UN University, because we are a think tank in the UN system, uh, our interest is obviously to be able to conduct the research that will provide those answers. So there's a very vested interest, if you will, in, in this uh, session from our side. So let me <clears throat> start with, the, uh, with my presentation. And I would like to start by highlighting what we think are the uh, policy-relevant re research gaps around this water energy nexus. And I say policy-relevant specifically because we weren't looking at uh, any technology issues or technology gaps per se, uh, and, and so it's a, it's a, a very much of an applied focus uh, and, and not a technology focus. I will then look at some of the information and data gaps and also the risks and opportunities which are there in creating some new uh, partnerships around research. And finally, I'll conclude with the questions for, for the panel, uh, and, and we'll leave those questions up there so that uh, you know, we, we are guiding our discussion uh, in a way of answering those questions. So let's look at what the uh, challenge areas are, are in terms of this water energy nexus research. There are five broad areas that, that I've identified, uh, and uh, I'm sure we, we will enrich that list further as we go to the end of the session. The first area is that uh, we need to get better at identifying what the trade-offs are, and indeed in terms of quantifying them uh, between water energy uh, solutions. And, and we've seen a number of examples that although we would like to have win-win uh, stories in all the cases, in reality that, that happens actually very rarely and you do have to have some policy trade-offs. And, and the 
result is that at the moment we see that there are very significant disconnects in, in policy development. And, and there are some things that we intuitively think would make sense that they are, uh, they are done together in terms of policy planning. And, and they're not being done. And I, I won't go into the examples because we've heard actually quite a bit about those. So we need to inform the policy processes so that uh, when they have to make a trade-off, they know exactly what is being traded off. And of course, in many cases, these trade-offs are rather uh, context-specific. So there's a lot of room for research as, as far as I can see. We also need to analyze the asymmetries. And again, I will not expand on that because I spoke about it on, in, in my presentation in the, on the first day. There's quite a range of asymmetries between the water and energy sectors. But I wanted to drill into the asymmetries in research. And one interesting indicator I found was the research investment that goes into energy sector versus what goes into the water sector. So this is... Uh, uh, millions of uh, dollars which are invested in the, uh, in the research, development, and dissemination in the energy side. And of course, the IEA, IEA had uh, very nicely tabulated data where you can see what the investments are uh, into research uh, for, for energy issues. And roughly speaking, they're uh, sitting at between uh, three and four billion dollars a year. Now, unfortunately for water, uh, it's very difficult to find similarly tabulated data which show you trends of research investments. Uh, the, the only information I could find for 2011 was for European countries, the public sector research uh, is about half a billion euro collectively, out of which about uh, 170 mi uh, million euro comes from uh, EU and the rest is from the individual countries. And that adds up to about 700 uh, million uh, U.S. dollars. But by juxtaposing these numbers, you can clearly see what the asymmetry is. There's almost an order of magnitude difference uh, between the, the uh, investment into research, which is available for, uh, for water versus what is available for energy. And now we are trying to convince the same folks that they should be investing into research on uh, water energy nexus. So it's a, it's a challenging starting point, but we have to still analyze it. The second research area is around benefit sharing. And, and again, there's a number of dimensions within that. Uh, for example, uh, we haven't really quite gotten a handle on how do we estimate the leverage benefits by actually uh, investing in one, we, you would get benefits for the other. Uh, and, and again, it makes uh, some intuitive sense, but we have very little data to actually uh, document uh, th that these leverage benefits exist. And, and where we have data, they are, uh, again, quite localized and, and context-specific. So we need to open up that box. Uh, similarly, in terms of uh, looking at transboundary situations, uh, the, the benefit sharing with water energy, uh, th there's, there's quite uh, limited information available. And actually, I can uh, mention three uh, specific basins that, that have had some kind of engagement in over the last few years. Uh, in, in Central Asia, in the Sardaria and Abu Darya Basin, particularly between Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan, there are very severe water sharing and energy sharing problems, uh, which are actually not being discussed uh, jointly. We did a study about 12 years ago in the Ganges Brahmaputra Basin uh, between India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, and we found that by discussing water sharing alone, you could not reach any kind of conclusion, even in an informal setting. But when you throw in energy into the mix, you actually start to find some very interesting solutions. And the third one is uh, uh, the Indus Basin between India and Pakistan, but actually the basin also includes Afghanistan and China, and talk about ground zero for trouble. Uh, and this is an analysis that we're currently undertaking. So anyway, that benefit sharing is, is not done uh, in a very systematic way. Similarly, benefits to climate change adaptation is something that I don't think we've heard, at least in the, in the context of this conference. 
a uh, lot of the investment into energy research has to do typically directly with mitigation, but there's been quite little work done on adaptation and how the, the joint benefits to, uh, to adaptation to climate change uh, would be uh, resulting in benefits to both water and energy uh, domains. The third area is the risk analysis. Uh, and I think this came up now in a number of different contexts within the conference that uh, these uh, linked risks, whether they deal with climate change or water security, uh, they're, they're not really uh, well understood. And oftentimes, uh, I, I think uh, Diego had given this example that uh, uh, energy planners are using an average water availability for the next 30 years and not really uh, analyzing and understanding the underlying risks. Now, there is another layer of risks which have to deal with societal instability and with economic crises. There was a U.S. intelligence community assessment last year uh, that pointed to very severe uh, potential problems in terms of societal instability in a number of countries and a number of basins. I just mentioned actually all three of them which were on that list. Uh, and that this could lead to uh, the, the water security situation itself could lead to, uh, to crises of different kinds. And, and that can also be tied to uh, uh, impacts on, on energy. And again, there's very little understanding of how that security domain uh, impacts the, the, the risks to these. And, of course, that's the underlying problem that you, we haven't quantified and valued uh, those risks appropriately. Okay, number four research area is the development agenda. And let me start with the obvious one, which is the post-2015 development agenda. Um, I'm certainly much more familiar with the developments around the water, uh, SDG, uh, and the post-2015 uh, post development goals. Um, but what, what I can see is that uh, this interlinking of targets and indeed of goals themselves uh, does not seem to be happening at, at the moment. And we've started to unpack uh, some of these, uh, these underlying sort of research issues uh, in, in where really are uh, the mechanisms for interlinking, and, and there's a lot more that needs to be done. We heard quite a bit about economic and policy instruments. Uh, that you need to have those in place. But what they look like, we don't really know very much about. And there's, again, very few anecdotal examples of national scale uh, policy or economic instruments. But the real challenge also is connecting across scales. Uh, and, and I think it came out this morning uh, when we were looking at some, some micro scale case studies, micro scale meaning at the, at the village level. And how do you connect that to the policy which is coming down from the top? Uh, and, and typically, we also know that water management happens at, at that scale oftentimes in the initiatives, whereas energy quite typically is, is being tackled at the national scale. So how do we cut across this, these scales? There's considerations of social equity, and I don't want to belabor the point about this, uh, these bottom billion people. And again, we need to uh, define policies which are addressing these uh, the, the challenges of these bottom billion. I really liked uh, uh, what Tong Pang was talking about, the pro-poor public-private partnerships, the 5P approaches, I think are really something that need to be explored for scaling up. And again, we heard about uh, the, the, uh, the modeling and the scenario building, which forms an essential part of long-term policy and development agenda, and we don't yet have these dynamically interlinked models that will give us the answers. And finally, the, the fifth area is uh, looking at resource-sufficient uh, technologies. Um, particularly, I think there was quite a bit of discussion around uh, inefficiencies, uh, the uh, comparison of various technologies in particular context, uh, and, and this was, I think, a nice point that came out on the first day that when you uh, try to compare technologies at, at, at a global scale, you get this very broad range, and, and you need to somehow narrow that. And similarly, uh, for uh, having some, some research done around 
how do you finance and enable those technologies, and again, what enabling environments are needed. As I said, we also would like to look at the information and data gaps. These are not research gaps per se, but they would feed into uh, undertaking the, the research. There's very significant disp uh, disparity in uh, energy and water data availability and access. Uh, in many cases, water data typically tends to be more difficult to, to get access to, and it's less processed. And the graph that I was just presenting a few moments ago gives you the classic example of not being able to even guess at what the global expenditures on water-related research are. And similarly, uh, in shared basins, water resource, uh, water volume, and water quality data are actually quite difficult to come by, and unless you have treaties already in place, bilateral or multilateral ones, uh, countries try to protect their the data. Uh, perhaps I'm not saying anything new there. Uh, in terms of uh, the accounting, particularly in the energy sector, of the externalities which are uh, associated both on the societal side and the environmental side, this triple bottom line, so you just don't have economic, but you have social and uh, environmental uh, accounting also done side by side. That's typically not being done. We heard some discussions uh, that there is a greater emphasis on valuation of water. And uh, another gap is this linking between the prices of water and energy because the two of them are quite symbiotic in their, in their uh, relationship. And finally, to talk about some risks and opportunities in research partnerships. Uh, and it's not all, all positive. There are certain risks associated as well. The most obvious one is that there can be a public perception, which I would think would be skewed, that these partnerships are somehow uh, pushing things which are seen uh, by many, particularly in the NGO community, as, as negative activities. Uh, and I cite here three examples, fracking dams and biofuels. All of them at certain level have uh, a, a civil society opposition to, to all of those. And by associating research, we have to be very careful that we're not seen as uh, trying to drive the uh, the uh, and the, uh, uh, the the policy in one direction to uh, to uh, uh, implementing of these technologies alone. Secondly, there's these asymmetries, me meaning that there are very significantly different resources which are available, and there are also lobbies. I just give the example of the NGO, which I would consider cumulatively as a lobby, uh, and sometimes these positions can override what would be the broad public interest. And again, you have to be mindful that your research is not being driven by either these asymmetries or the push and pull by the, by the lobbies. Having said that, there are positive opportunities. You can certainly use the research to drive policy agenda. At the end of the day, that can drive uh, economic enhancement, creation of alternative livelihoods. Uh, <clears throat> and Interestingly, research and having information coming from credible uh, sources can actually help change public perception and eventually public uh, consumption patterns, which I think is essentially what we will need to be driving at if we are to uh, achieve sustainability. So there's, there's some very interesting opportunities. So that sort of completes my presentation. Uh, we had posed some questions to the panel, and like I said, we'll leave these up there uh, for most of the time so that we're able to see what the questions are that each of the panelists are, are being asked to answer. And the questions are, what are the gaps? And, and I have pointed out a few uh, and, and uh, talked about asymmetries, but we would certainly like to hear the perspectives from, uh, the, uh, from the panelists. Secondly, can we point to examples of how research has gone about to address some of these, uh, these uh, challenges and how it has informed policy formulation? And uh, can we learn more generic lessons from, from those examples? And uh, the third question is, are there modalities for partnerships uh, of the scientific and research community with governments, with private sector, with other 
stakeholders, local communities, etc. And uh, whether those new modalities can somehow help uh, create these partnerships, uh, which we were all uh, discussing over the last couple of days, and, and we know that there are certain difficulties in, uh, in achieving them. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to uh, introduce the, the panelists one by one and uh, ask them to uh, share with us their initial response to these questions, and so they can certainly draw on their uh, um, quite diverse experience. Uh, we're, we're missing one panelist, so that gives us a little bit more time, uh, but uh, I would still uh, request that you try to contain your initial response to about uh, five minutes, and then we might have a round of questions, and, and uh, we might carry on from there. So the first panelist is uh, Mr. John Payne. He's an independent consultant. Uh, until quite recently, he was working for SNC-Lavalin, which is a big Canadian uh, international uh, uh, consulting company. And more interestingly, though, I think uh, he's done a lot of work with Unido and has been a major contributor to the, uh, the present World Water Development Report on the water energy issues. So, John, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at this uh, this gathering, especially uh, one on a full stomach after lunch. That's always nice to see. And if you happen to see me sinking beneath this table, it might be because I ate too much, but this chair is sort of slowly <laughs> decreasing, so I may have to um, get some sort of nexus going here to get myself back up again. Um, I'd like to thank... Uh, Josefina for, for the conference and Adil for organizing this session. Um, I personally had a little experience with a water energy access of my own um, in North America where I live in Ontario. In uh, December we had uh, the perfect two ice storms and uh, as they went through they, they, they loaded up the trees and the trees broke the power lines. So uh, no power, of course. So score one for water, because we've been hearing that energy trumps water. But we just heard that we have to look at the full circle coming back. And it was interesting, because I was out of power for, um, what, a day and a half. And I found myself spending a lot of time going out chopping wood and lighting fires. So I felt like some of the stories we've been hearing coming from the developing countries and all the time spent doing this really brings it home to you how tough it can be when you don't have these amenities. So it was an, an interesting sort of little intro to coming here this, um, this January. Um, Adil asked me to look at some of the, the knowledge gaps, particularly in the private sector, and I'm going to look in, in a very much an overview way of some of the obstacles that um, might be addressed for better water and energy efficiency in the private sector. And by that I mean the manufacturing and extractive industries. I'm not talking about power or agriculture. They're the purview of others. So it seemed to me that when I was thinking about this that we're not just talking about knowledge gaps in a technical sense uh, for these, the, the private sector. We're looking at gaps in understanding, in business strategy, in economics, and in finance. And these go along with the obvious gaps in communications, data gathering, which we, we've heard a lot about and which Dell has just mentioned, and measurement and metrics that go along with that. So I'm not going to elaborate on those because we, we have heard about some of them. But these things present industry with certain conundrums. I hope the translator picks up on that word. I don't know what the Spanish would be for that one. But I use this word deliberately instead of challenges because a challenge is, I find, is an overused, sort of tired word, a bit of a cliche now, because it also has the implication that it's something one can accept or decline, whereas conundrums are a complex, perplexing problem. They're truly dilemmas with no clear solutions. And I think that the water energy nexus might be better termed the water energy dilemma. But... This all being said, a dilemma requires a resolution of sorts to be able to move forward, particularly in the private sector, because you just can't stand still. Business just doesn't stop. So when you're faced with these, these conundrums, these dilemmas, you have to say, okay, how do we move forward? So to outline some of these, 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 these conundrums, um, 
I put them in a general perspective. The first one is very obvious, we all know it. It's literally the conundrum of globalization. We all know the statistics, we've heard about them. Industry uses approximately 20% of water withdrawals, 37% of primary global energy use. And these are substantial numbers and they're predicted to grow significantly. Energy demand by a third, I think, by 2035. Water withdrawals, 55% by 2050. So the conundrum is how to spread the benefits of industrialization more globally without unsustainable impacts on water, energy, and other natural resources. So I put that out as a thought and move on to the second conundrum, which is one we've heard a little bit about, but it's the conundrum of innovative technology. People look to new technology to solve the water and energy problems. It's like a sort of white knight marching in and it's all over, we've solved it. But there are several hurdles here. First of all, there's not really a lack of good ideas or technologies, but there's almost a corollary conundrum here that there are too many solutions looking for needs and problems. And then the constraint becomes cost rather than technical capability. As a, as a cynic said some time ago, and I'm sort of kind of quoting it, but a view has expressed that any water can be made safely potable if you filter it through enough money. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. And I think the major hurdle for the, these new technology developers and suppliers is how do you get from the laboratory and the concept stage through to the pilot stage, and then an even bigger hurdle is how do you get to commercial implementation. And that, that's a whole discussion we can have in the session. I'm hoping we can get into that. I've got some more thoughts on that. Um, this leads to a financial conundrum for the managers of industry because they've got to consider buying new technology. And they have to balance short-term profit and shareholder pressure against longer-term gains. And this is a real difficulty for them because in relation to this, in industry, there's less of a nexus between water and energy than in other sectors. This is really because industry is a sort of end user of both. It doesn't really commonly evaluate the link between water and energy in its own sort of business sense. They're generally managed separately. You have a guy managing energy, a guy managing water. And they're treated as sort of rather two independent components and production costs in a process. And then you get trade-offs between them. But not so much a win-win. So it's a difficult situation when it comes to this. And then there's the, the conundrum of private sector and industrial priorities. We have the, the issue of increased production and efficiency. Um, industry's production is, increased production for industry is the primary focus and goal of the private sector rather than water and energy efficiency and conservation. So industry's interest in the private sector is often to secure water and energy at the lowest price and not necessarily in the program of water and energy efficiency. The efficiency can be driven in terms of cost benefit as it relates to company profits. But again, there's a sort of corollary or, or reverse side to this. And it's the rebound effect of efficiency because uh, there's a great temptation when you have water and energy savings to use them to produce more. So in, in effect, you get the efficiency, but you don't save total water or energy use. And then, of course, we all know about the conundrum of profit, because in, industry is interested in measuring the cost effects of efficiency on its bottom line, but government and civil society is focused on overall economic results, social benefits, and the environment. So there's a disconnect here. And finally, there's the, um, the conundrum of societal responsibility because manufacturing has traditionally been thought of in terms of mass employment. But now, and, and we've heard about McKinsey earlier on today, I'm quoting them again, they say it's a critical driver of innovation, productivity, and competitiveness. So it has a different sort of modus operandi. And as such, uh, policymakers need to understand the diversity of industry and its position in the wider national and regional economy, which obviously includes the three uh, pillars of sustainable development, the economic side, the social, and the environmental side. And the final sort of corollary conundrum, if you like, is one of location. 
it's where do you put industry? Do you locate it where the labor and raw materials are found, where the market is found, or where the water and energy are available? So with the limited time, I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm hoping that these sort of broad thoughts might stimulate some discussion as to how the private sector might adapt and provide some solutions to, to their particular dilemmas within this water energy um, problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. So that gives us quite a few points to think about uh, research that can uh, perhaps directly help the private sector. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll just pause for a moment to see if there are any immediate questions for John before we go to the next panelist. Uh, yes, go ahead. Barbara. Um, yeah, my question is, I'm not sure whether it's coming too early, not knowing what else will be presented, but I'm trying it with you now. I found it interesting that you said um, we don't really have a gap of technological solutions. Actually, we might have too many, but we are looking for the problems that go with them. Yeah. Um, to me, this is a matter of uh, also wrong ways of doing research, which disconnect the researchers and leave them in their ivory towers, while you know the, the practitioners, policymakers, and so on are waiting for very special things mm -hmm. to solve their proper problems. So my question would be: Do you have any suggestions or any? Um, uh, experiences in mind from research processes that have made a difference, that bridged that gap between the two sides and made research more relevant right from the beginning? Uh, I think so. Um, I, I think what I was saying, there's a bit of a sort of cart before the horse thing going on and at various events and conferences I've attended, um, um, technology companies in particular have shown up and said, I've got this great idea to sort of, you know, take, um, take this nutrient out of water or do this. And everybody's looking around and said, but I don't need that. I need something else. So that is an issue. And I think, um, and I can enlarge on this later, but um, again, I'm going to go local. In, in Ontario, there are several organizations that are, are trying to um, bridge this gap. And, and one of them... Uh, um, a deal will know water tap for instance, are trying to, to sort of commercialize technologies and trying to bring the two sides together and find out what A needs and, and B can supply. And I think that's where these sort of non-profit groups, that, there's, I can think of three of them actually in Ontario that do this, and, and they get talking to one another. And then once you have that forum, and I sat through one of these in, um, in the fall, it was quite interesting because... When, when one of the, the, the utilities, water utility group said, oh, we really need this, then, then a light went off somewhere in the audience and said, I, ah, now I, have, I do have that. And that sort of got them together. Um, so I, I know it's a little bit of a cynical view to say there's too many solutions looking for, for but, but it is actually true because there's quite a lot of grant money out, but so many of them fail. They get to the certain point and then they, they just can't go any further. So it does need to be focused more wisely, I think. Thank you. Just to add to that, I'm also aware of a, an initiative in, uh, in, in Europe where the utilities get married with technologies and with the capital providers. Yeah. So there is a speed dating service, if you will, <laughs> where, where these folks are, are connected through. Uh, and, and that's a nice filter to see whether those who, who need it can actually, uh, th those who can use it actually need it. Uh, yes, go ahead. Diego. Yeah, it's, it's just a, well, it's a, I guess it's a comment and a bit of a, a question for the, for the panel maybe to, to raise during the discussion. Is, uh, I think, uh, uh, alluding a bit to what uh, uh, our colleague was just saying now, I mean, there's research and there's research, no? So there's, uh, in a sense, there is research that is not applied and it's not very useful for the uh, I mean, it, it's fantastic for the academia and for global knowledge, but it's not useful for the utility that has a problem. It's not useful for the government that is has a, uh, uh, the challenge or the conundrum, as John was saying, of uh, 
designing a new energy plan that will make uh, the difference on the ground where investments will will be implemented. So I think it's it's crucial that you know we have the discussion on how do you ensure that uh, you are you have a, a, a concrete client on the ground and you're addressing their needs. Uh, just to put you an example, in the Nile Basin, there are 45 decision support systems. None of those are used by the government. They use a different one. So that's, you know, and this means that 10 years of work from researchers, millions of dollars have been wasted. You know, so that they, I think that for us, we have to really understand that there is a client. We have to look to the eyes of that client. And, and when you look at the water and energy, there are already some efforts in academia, all building different models. Most of them will not be used. You have to go and ask the client what kind of platform <coughs> you want to use and then strengthen that platform. Thank you, Diego. Uh, one more. I think there's a fine line between being client-driven, which you absolutely have to be, and the perception I was saying there's a risk that you might be seen as uh, providing the answer uh, that the client already wants to hear. So uh, you, we have to be careful in the research community. Well. I think there's two needs there. Uh, there is a, a recognition of the dimension of any one problem, and today's is uh, water and energy solutions and be the flexibility which is allowed to the market to uh, further, I mean, to construct solutions. I'll take an example in the water sector, something like 20 years ago. Uh, in Milwaukee, there's been this major incident with the cryptosporidium, and at that time, I mean, the community at large was searching for solutions, and it's just one relatively minor UV lamp manufacturer who say, I have a solution. At that time, no one thought that UV would be the proper solution to the crypto. Uh, threat, so to say. And it's just because that uh, manufacturer went to a North American consultant who went to a uh, um, academic in, Alba in Alberta who demonstrated the effectiveness of UV lamps against that threat that triggered, I would say, half of the major utilities throughout the world to a switch to UV disinfection. So the, this is a brilliant example as to how the recognition of the size of the threat, plus, frankly, the, the diversity of offerings, plus the added value of academics who know about the, I would have to say the business, no, but know about the methodology to establish and prove the efficiency of a technology. This is what enabled this to happen. Okay, thank you. John, any quick feedback? Um, not, not really. I mean, when I've listened to some of the major corporations talking about their problems, they, they've rarely talked about technology being a big issue for them. It's always been things, I, I just kept some notes here. I listened to a guy from Coca-Cola recently, and their big issues were water quality, water availability, regulation, public perception, all of those sorts of things where they needed to overcome these hurdles to, to, to move on. And there was... No, they didn't feel, you know, they felt that they could sort of get the technology if they needed it, if it was a problem for them. That, that's why I sort of mentioned that in my, my discussion, that it seems to be sort of lower down the list of priorities in many ways, okay. even though, I mean, we obviously need it. Thanks. There, there, I've noted, I think there's a couple of interesting questions that we will come back to in, when we get to the discussion. Let me introduce our uh, next panelist, Dr. Yasutoshi Shimizu. Uh, he's from Toto, uh, company in Japan, uh, one of the largest uh, manufacturers of uh, uh, sanitary equipment in, in Japan, or the largest, I should say, uh, uh, in Japan. And he's going to talk about how uh, research plugs into their work and how do they relate to the uh, research and academic community. Thank would you, Chairman. Would you like your... Yeah, is that okay? Please. Please show the sound slide, please. Okay. Before start our presentation, our force from Japan, do you understand the one situation? All of you and for us Japanese, there are so, so huge language barriers. Please uh, ask, ask for some question to easy way. Yep. But I will start. And I will introduce our research-based 
uh, approaches. Uh, we will show you the example of partnership formation to be realized uh, a policy at water and energy nexuses. As you know, our company Toto is a manufacturer of water-related housing equipment such as toilet bowls and showers, as, as you know. Uh, Toto builds a strategy which aimed at promoting a business and environmental contribu contribution simultaneously five years ago. Our uh, presentation is based on these strategies. In total, the amount of water used by uh, products is continuously being reduced. For example, this is an example. Toilet bowls made 20 years ago needed a certain liter to flush. The latest one has been reduced to less than four liters. In Japan, please change it. Uh, in Japan, a toilet bowl is retrofitted in about 20 years' time. By this retrofit, the amount of uh, domestic water used is greatly reduced. The key of our strategy is water saving equipment spread. By uh, simulation research, we drew a, a future image realizable by water saving equipment spread and classify the role which each uh, stakeholder plays to. Uh, realize the future image we pro uh, proposed. Uh, before our simulation research in Japan, water saving was evaluated as uh, only a reduction in household water cost. Uh, we extended the evaluation boundary. Next, please. We uh, extend the evaluation boundary from the household economy to the whole of Japan and performed the impact analysis. This analysis focused on the co-benefits of water savings, water resources preservation, energy reduction, and CO2 reduction effects. This analysis showed next one, please. This analysis showed 1% of both energy and uh, energy consumption and CO2 emissions can be reducible by the spread of water saving equipment. It was a target image. By the way. Uh, user can choose the equipment of various environmental performances, it means the water uh, usage in the retrofit timing. Since the high performance equipment includes the technology to realize it, it is more expensive than the uh, common one. To realize a 1% energy and CO2 reduction, it is uh, necessary to make the situation where users uh, select the high performance one. For this purpose, it was indicated that water saving awareness promotion and subsidy system was effective. This roadmap was released as research papers and shared by each stakeholder. As a result, in Japan, the industry, academia, and government corporate cooperation organization for water saving promotion has constructed and the subsidy system for water saving equipment spread has started in Japan. And uh, this uh, fact database approach was noted by Environmental Administration in Japan, and it is adapted also as uh, Asian uh, the environmental strategy of Japanese government. In order to extract the uh, typical example of water saving contribution in developing countries, a uh, water saving project is planned to start in Vietnam. Co-worker uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Toyosada will explain the uh, Vietnam project. Please. Yes. Continue. Yes, Dr. Dr. Toyosada. I'm sorry, I didn't introduce you uh, up front, but uh, uh, Dr. To to uh, Kanako Toyosada is also from uh, Toto, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for introducing. And please change, change okay. materials. Uh, oh, the, the yeah. other one. Okay. This one. Okay. This one. And my, my colleague, Dr. Schmitz, has just explained about the example of the partnership formation to realize a policy at Water Energy Nexus in Japan. Next, I will talk on the water saving project in Vietnam. As a typical e example of a water saving contribution in developing countries. By support of the Ministry of Environment in Japan, we evaluated 
the environmental contribution potential through water saving equipment spread in Vietnam. But it was a problem that there is no standard which select water saving equipment in Vietnam. Next, please. For example, a shower's function is to comfortably wash one's body. A toilet must flush away waste, which is e easily transported along pipes. Because these functions are more effic efficient, effective with large amount of water, water saving and functionality are naturally opposing. Water saving products which do not maintain appropriate function may cause issues. For example, customers will be dissatisfied with a shower that does not have good water rate, good water flow. In the case of a toilet, the waste not clearing with one flush and the pipe blockages a possible problem. Next, please. And so, functionality and water saving must be a set when deciding to establish standard which restrict toilet flush volume and shower flow rate. In order to propose the water saving standards for the Vietnamese government, partnership with an academic side is necessary. Next, please. Because of this need, the Asian Saving Water Council was est established in 2011. It is made of architectural and plumbing specialists from universities across Japan, China, Korea, and Taiwan, and Hong Kong. TOTO is currently carries out the council's administration. Uh, Dr. Smith is um, general secretary. secretary. In the Asian Saving Water Council plans to make water saving standards proposals to the Vietnamese government through the water saving project in Vietnam. We experienced that a partnership with an academic side is very important. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. A any questions for the two colleagues? <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so you show some um, some information on at, at product level, uh, water saving product level. I was just wondering, uh, as part of the work of the Asian Water Saving Council, do you also have some kind of similar work at building level? So, for example, some kind of um, label or standardization for the buildings or the flats where, um, you know, some optimization of the water and energy um, schemes would be, uh, would be implemented. Because I think what you showed is like with the uh, water using product, you can have 15% uh, of uh, water savings, but then it's only related to 1% of energy saving. Uh, and I think at building level, most of the energy savings can be um, related to water use are related to the heating of the water. So I was just wondering, at building level, do you have uh, some kind of similar initiatives? Yeah. You mean the certification for the water saving or something? Uh, well, some kind of um, certification of water performance of buildings or something like that. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we have the plan to uh, start the water saving project in Vietnam. One problem, we, uh, one uh, obstacle is uh, there is no uh, standard, so she, she explains that another uh, one issue is th there is no uh, water saving awareness uh, was fermented over there. So we started the, uh, the certification uh, systems. Uh, we uh, proposed to the Vietnamese government to the certification project, uh, certification program for the first uh, for. Uh, prominent uh, hotel or some big uh, buildings. Uh, Asian Water Saving Council will be the driver for the certification systems, we think. Yeah. 
So the question might be whether you can actually argue for certification for both energy and water saving. Yeah. Uh, and, and also CO2 reduction. And CO2, yeah, okay, yeah. good. So, so that's something which is yeah, it's very, part of your uh, thinking. Uh, very strongly linkaged it, yeah. Okay, good. Any other? One more. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Clara Presa from SINAE, the water cluster here in Zaragoza. It's a water cluster of the Aragon region but it's based here in this city. Um, I, I just wanted to share our experience because it's very similar with your, the one that we have just heard. Uh, we carry out a study with the University of Zaragoza. Uh, we studied uh, a sample of uh, houses here in the city and we studied uh, the, um, the devices, the water consuming devices, the, both the showers, the taps and the toilets and how they were running and what was the consumption of these devices and what was the impact of changing those devices for ones that, was, that would be more ecological, more water saving, uh, that, that use more water saving technology. And our key findings was that there was a strong potential of water saving, but the thing is that the consumers um, it was very expensive for the consumers and because uh, uh, the, the water is so cheap that doesn't compensate the consumers to change the devices. But we are starting studying how does the, uh, uh, how the um, electricity influence in this equation because uh, of the heat of the uh, water uh, consumption. So it would be very nice to share our uh, study with you and and, and change uh, our impressions about this issue. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, one more question up here. Here. Uh, Sorry. Adil, this is a kind of question observation at the same same time, if I may. Um, and uh, John John mentioned uh, research, and so it was only technology. Um, I read a, a paper recently, I think it was in the Financial Times, um, explaining that uh, Toto had uh, entered the UK market um, and were having a lot of difficulty selling their product, not because it doesn't work or because uh, uh, it's not certified, it is that Engl English people won't adapt to wiping their backsides in a particular way or not wiping their backsides. So that, that sort of leads to the question, what about research into, into behavioral change and how do you um, stimulate behavioral change? And that was very much the, the, the point made in the McKinsey article I referred to this morning about energy. So um, it's two questions in one there for you. Would you like to answer? For, for me? Yeah. yeah. For, for us, thinking that to change, change the thinking of the user's mind is very difficult. So now, 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 now stages. First, our communication target is not the user, but the government. The, we, we first we will start the subsidy system or a campaign, a water saving campaign system, and then it, we we will uh, change the uh, user's mind through the uh, government's uh, sub, uh, systems. We think, yeah. So first, uh, our approach is first start in Japan, and it, it's next Japan, uh, expanded uh, to the Asian nations near our uh, suburbs. Yeah. And this area is perhaps 10 years old, <laughs> over there. Yeah. John, do you want to add a I quick point? I just wanted to add a little sort of anecdote about that. So you can again, get the mic. Again, a little bit on a personal level. I'm not sure if you're referring to behavioral change or sort of consumer resistance to a name or a product, but um, Toto actually are big sellers in Canada. And I, I was just, when we were talking before the meeting, I remarked that I just installed my fourth Toto toilet in our house, and I've had absolutely no problem in, with them. They, they, they've worked very well. I'm not, I'm not being paid to say this, by the way. Um, so I don't know if there's a behavioral issue, at least in North America with them, because I think they're very popular there. 
Okay. Well, I think we might come back to that and explore it a bit more. But I would be I, – I I'm pleased to introduce our fourth panelist, uh, Dr. Alberto Garrido, who's a professor at the University of Madrid and also associated with the Botin Foundation. Uh, he's done a lot of work in Latin America, and we thought that it would be useful to bring some of that experience to, to this discussion and to try and answer some of these questions around uh, uh, knowledge gaps and, and uh, opportunities for partnerships. So, Alberto, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank um, uh, the United Nations on Water Program for, and Josefina for inviting us to, to talk about our work, um, which uh, I think comes at a very timely moment because uh, we, are, we just finished uh, the project and, and we, we are finishing a book that um, will be published uh, in a month or so. Um, don't, don't jump to, to buy it right now at Amazon. It will be uh, for free. So, um, so you will be able to, to, to look at it. Um, the title of the book is uh, Water uh, for Food Security and Well-Being in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, we came through, um, we, we started this project in, the, in Latin America with an idea of uh, connecting the dots between water and food security, which at the beginning was a topic that we thought it was not fully understood, and also, it came at a moment where uh, uh, a lot of massive exports from uh, Latin America of uh, agricultural commodities were starting. And, and at, at, at a certain moment, we came to the conclusion that Latin America was contributing a lot, significantly, to food security around the world. But the energy, the energy sector came, through, came along very quickly. And then we, we got into... Um, uh, into more detail on what are the energy issues, energy dimensions related to the topic of water and food security. So uh, in responding to the questions that were raised at the beginning, um, which, by the way, we were told not to use uh, slides. I would have used some, but uh, I, I want to mention just four questions. Maybe after the in the second round of interventions, I can, I can get into more detail in some of this. So research gaps that we came uh, to, to find in this project. First of all, water savings in irrigated agriculture uh, are, uh, stand, in a sense, uh, against energy consumption. Uh, we know that uh, increasingly, uh, precision agriculture, uh, the way to get the most out of the resources, require, in particular, in the area of irrigation, a lot of uh, energy and a lot of uh, um, uh, network control, which uh, uh, requires energy. And I'll give you just one example. Uh, sugar cane production in northeast Brazil. You know that there's massive production of sugar cane in south of Brazil. But in the north of Brazil, northeast Brazil, which is semi-arid, we are starting to see a lot of uh, production of sugar cane production, which is much more productive, much more profitable under irrigation. And even much more productive if the, if, if the technology of sub, subsurface uh, drip technology is used where you can multiply the, the, risk, the, the, the yields. Now, since this is much more profitable, profitable uh, uh, there is a connection between increasing use of water in a semi-arid area of Brazil and also energy to increase uh, the yields of, of, the, of the crop. And now, um, so this is one question that needs to be really well thought, well developed, because uh, it's a question, it's a context-free uh, uh, analysis. Where do you want to care about water? In which uh, locations is water more important than energy? And in which others you go, you went through the frontier, and then you are using too much energy to just to save uh, very little water. It's a pity that most of you were not here yesterday evening where uh, the manager of one of the biggest irrigation districts in, in the Ebro area was mentioning the fact uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big irrigation district, of more than 100,000 hectares of irrigated land. They're hooked up to the energy because they modernized their, their, their infrastructure. They converted the entire system from canals, open air canals, into uh, networks and tubes. And they want to uh, become fully disconnected from the grid of energy because it is very expensive 
So now they're really looking at solutions that allow them to run their irrigation distance without the need to purchase any kilowatt of, of energy from the, from the central grid, from the commercial uh, electricity service. Now, does this make sense? Is it really, uh, is it really a fear of the uh, untrustful energy sector regulation in Spain? Is it because it is too expensive? What is the cost of this? How many units of water are saved as a result of, of investing in these technologies? This is something that we're just now starting to think about and, and getting research, and there are huge research gaps on this topic. My second point, my second uh, family of gaps or, or questions is energy needs in water supply networks. Uh, we've heard a lot about this in, in, the, in the course of this, uh, of this seminar, this uh, uh, conference. But what about water intermittent services, which is a huge problem in, Latin America, in most of the Latin American uh, cities. You not only lose energy by cutting and ensuring that your service is intermittently served, but also uh, you allow pathogens entering the, the, the system because when energy, uh, when the energy in, inside the tube is lower than outside the tube, then water from the outside of the tube comes into the system with all kinds of pathogens. So, so the question here, do you want to run the, the systems at full, a full charge and lose energy? What, what are the consequences of that? What is the consequences of uh, serving the water at, uh, the, with a given pressure and then fill up the tanks where the water uh, loses all the pressure and then you start pumping again? These are questions that have been uh, discussed, but they're really important. They're huge problems in most Latin American uh, cities. My third point is just uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, we know uh, there is a lot of energy needed to uh, uh, treat wastewater. Uh, this is something that we, uh, we know. Uh, the technology is really associated to um, um, osmosis and all the questions of um, um, technologies. There's a, an important amount of energy involved in that, but that uh, that's also requires a, uh, 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 much more uh, science and research. Finally, a question uh, that has not been raised, uh, at least uh, from, from what I've heard in the conference, water use for bioenergy. This is another issue in Latin America. Many countries are producing a lot of uh, bioenergy, biomass production. The question is, now we know that there is a, uh, there, there, uh, there, you need a three square meters to produce one liter of bioethanol with sugar cane. But at the same time, we're seeing a lot of uh, countries producing bioethanol or biodiesel using much more land than three square meters per liter. So now the question is, what is the water involved in this? Well, the water is green water, it's land use. And this green water, as it's called by a water footprint network, it's also valuable water because it's all, it also feeds uh, um, uh, subsurface water, it feeds um, um, uh, the hydrological cycle, and also uh, it, of course, steals land from other uses that provide ecosystem services or provides all kinds of uh, agricultural production. So what is, the, uh, what, is the, what is the energy efficiency of that? What is the uh, sustainability efficiency of, use, of uh, promoting uh, uh, bio, biofuels, which all countries in Latin America are promoting. Uh, all governments are involved in promoting and subsidizing uh, biofuel production. Uh, and not all of them has the, have the, the, the efficiency that uh, bioethanol in Brazil has. So this is another, the fourth question I'd like to, to put in the table. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All, all are very thought-provoking uh, questions. Any questions to Alberto? Yes, Diego. Uh, just a quick question. Thanks, Alberto, for the presentation. Is uh, I, I I am familiar with uh, with the book, and uh, uh, I have a, a question. We've been talking about water savings and energy savings, uh, and this is probably for a future research question. What about the distributional impacts or the social impacts of these uh, trade-offs? No? Uh, when we are looking a lot about energy savings or the subsidies, I mean, who benefits and who loses from these uh, policies? Because for, in certain cases, maybe 
we need to use uh, much more of, of these resources uh, to target certain uh, sort of proper interventions. No? So uh, my question is whether you had any thoughts into this uh, or what, are your, what is your thinking for the future uh, research? Okay, that's an, an excellent question and topic. Uh, we didn't get into the detail of those uh, socioeconomic dimensions. Um, it is my perception that um, agricultural Latin America is really under huge and important revolution. Um, um, in particular, if you look at the case of Peru, for example, where horticultural production now is really uh, becoming uh, really important, and, and you see uh, applications of, uh, of the best technologies in, in the production of horticulture for, for exports. And, and, of course, there's a lot of energy involved in that, and there's also a lot of uh, water uh, in semi-arid areas. But at the same time, you see uh, they're now exporting $1 billion a year in that kind of product. So I know this is a really loose uh, answer to your question, but I think uh, my perception is that uh, uh, this is another research gap that we have to look at. Uh, there, there are social and there are socioeconomic dimensions in that, of course, but we didn't look at uh, that a dose in, in detail. Okay, go ahead. If I recall well, you did a presentation during the Stockholm Water Week two, two years ago, didn't you, addressing um, the say the issue of the harmful subsidies to the farming sector. I'm a little bit surprised that you didn't mention that as one of the key issues beyond what you already talked about regarding the biofuels, etc. But I thought this presentation you made over there was absolutely relevant with regards to the span of, the, of, of, of your thoughts regarding where to best address uh, the issue of water scarcity uh, and, and, and today the energy scarcity as well. I'm a little bit surprised that you do not, I mean, put onto the picture the, the job you've done there. Well, thank you for the question and thank you for um, remembering my presentation two years ago. That's it's really kind of you. Um, I don't know, um, um, you know, Latin America is quite a heterogeneous region, um, and with regards to water, you see many different kinds of problems. You generally tend to think that the, the region is uh, water abundant, but when you look at, into details, you see that um, uh, a significant proportion of the people live in areas where water is scarce, um, and you see a huge boom of the mining and energy sectors uh, occurring and happening in the most arid and semi-arid regions, uh, whereas uh, in other regions where in Colombia or, or in Ecuador you see the mining and energy sectors occurring in areas where there's an abundance of water, but at the same time uh, the, the pollution effects of these mining activities are really threatening the, the ecosystems uh, conservation of many important regions. So. Um, we, we, we're not sure uh, subsidies are so relevant in, in, in the region. Uh, we, we can think uh, in terms of uh, supporting agriculture as we think in, in the European Union where really support is clearly very, very relevant and very important. In the region, I don't, I don't see uh, the government support being uh, so uh, relevant for, uh, for uh, like the types of, uh, of activities and, and production that uh, we are seeing. It's more a question of... of um, really using the opportunities that the abundance of natural resources, land and water, provide to the, to the, to the countries, and also the uh, liberalization of uh, many of these products that are, that are, not, that are now really becoming opportunities for, for increasing production. But uh, uh, we didn't look at the, the question of uh, government support, and, and in particular to subsidies to these kind of products. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? What I would like to do now, there is about uh, 20 minutes now remaining in our session, uh, and I would really like to draw your attention to the three questions which are uh, displayed here and to perhaps share your thoughts in, in terms of what gaps are there, whether there are examples in your domain that can answer some of those, and also uh, to talk about how research partnerships uh, can come about, and are there maybe some new, different modalities for that? Uh, Michaela, you still had a question to Alberto? Yes. Well, please go ahead. The last, the last question for um, uh, Professor Gorudo. Thank you very much for your presentation, for your talk here. Um, I was very much interested in the part that you were saying about biofuels, 
production of biofuels. So I was thinking if this is, uh, and you said that there is, uh, the energy policies there are promoting very much the, 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 the biofuel production. So I was wondering if this is, uh, in a certain sense, also related to the phenomenon of land, land grabbing that there is also in Latin America, not only in, in Africa. And I know that in certain countries, actually, they are, they are uh, taking measures uh, uh, against the land grabbing like uh, in Argentina. So I don't know if you, if you have some thought about that. The, the phenomenon of land grabbing? Okay. Um, I answer? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, you know, the question of land grabbing is um, polysemic in a sense that uh, you can, you can call land grab any kind of um, agreement. Um, and I know it's a very controversial issue. Uh, it is my perception that uh, you cannot use the, the word land grabbing for the case of Latin America. Uh, it, it's a different thing than the most extreme examples of land grabbing. It's a question of uh, investment, and I think um, most of the governments in the region are uh, equipped with legislation enough to protect their lands and their rights from, um, the, from you know, land grabbers. That doesn't mean that uh, companies within the region are investing in the countries. So you see a lot of investment in that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that land, land grabbing. I, I think it's a, it's a question that uh, it's more investment in opportunities and, and that kind of agriculture is already going on in many of the, of the, of the, of the countries there. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that a land grab phenomenon. Although it, sometimes some authors have associated uh, the process to observations of land use in Latin America. I, I, would, I would not agree with that. Okay, good. Any other questions or thoughts or ideas now to try and help our answering the questions? Diego. Sorry, it's me again. Uh, no, I, I thought on the, I, I want to do a, a plea uh, based on your questions. Um, I think we have to go back to being serious about um, the economic analysis. And I would strongly suggest, you know, that when we look at nexuses, it's not only about looking at the technological trade-offs or, uh, you know, very sort of technology-based uh, analysis, but that if we want to look at uh, distributional impacts, if we really want to look at... Uh, valuation and pricing that uh, we are serious about properly incorporating in certain cases obviously the partial equilibrium analysis but uh, also that we st start to strengthen the way that we incorporate uh, water and energy and other resources on general equilibrium frameworks. Uh, water is extremely tricky to, to incorporate in CG modeling because there are no markets um, for that usually. We, South Africa just did a you know, very extensive and robust exercise on incorporating. They have a water smart CG, but it took them a couple of years, extremely difficult to do. Uh, but I think that, that we can start supporting you know, the, the science to, to incorporate some of these dimensions. That will allow us also to look at uh, impacts or, or effects beyond uh, the the current sectors, no? beyond water and energy, and look at economy-wide implications of some of these uh, measures. Well, thank you very much for that call to action. I think that's very well taken. Uh, other comments, Jack? Here. <laughs> Well, first of all, I very strongly recommend what, what has just been said about looking at the economics in, in the round, um, and the business sector is certainly doing, trying to do that from its own point of view, linking that with new approaches to, to accounting. So um, there's, some, there's some progress going, being made there. I think it's also extremely important to dig into this, the asymmetries. If we're talking about water and the energy sectors, because there are probably several, just as there several water sectors, we do need to be much more sophisticated on understanding why there are these asymmetries. And, and some of them are technological, some of them are to do with power base. Uh, energy tends to be looked at at a national level. 
uh, with a reasonable degree of power behind it relative to other subjects, nothing like defense, but um, um, energy security is viewed much higher profile generally than certainly water and sanitation in a, at an urban level. So we need to really understand why the, those are asymmetries. Uh, and that's important, I think, because uh, otherwise we may well end up making some sweeting statements that end up with some very harmful, unintended consequences. Um, studying the right thing the wrong way, producing the wrong answers can produce some very long-lasting damage, and we have to be very careful to avoid that, particularly when we get into uh, things like trying to look at the externalities in, in the economics, which are quite tricky. Okay, thank you. Alice? Alice? Yes, um, I was very much taken by the, um, by the suggestion that you made, Barbara, when you talked about uh, in the IWRM you have so many linkages between the different uh, uses and uses and then having that connected to energy and I repeat what you said in your slide, it was about the syst systematic assessment of potential for efficiency gains, especially in those linkages and I thought that was a very uh, um, prudent one actually. Okay, good. Other comments? Well, I also have some questions for the for the panelists, and uh, hopefully that can help move the discussion forward. Uh, let me start with you, Shimizu san. Uh, I think you gave us an uh, interesting example that I would like you to expand on a little bit in terms of a research collaboration where you said the government, the academia, mm -hmm. and you as a private sector were involved. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to understand a little bit better what made it work. So what made it work? Why was that research successful? Because you're saying the government is now going ahead and implementing that, and uh, there's a wider uptake of that. Uh, what was the driver for that research? Yeah. Why did it start? Mm -hmm. Was it purely mm -hmm. for business reasons? Yeah. Uh, who supported the academic community mm -hmm. to link up with this? Mm -hmm. uh, and what was the benefit, for example, that went back to the academic community? Because you certainly benefited as a private sector. You have now mm -hmm. a larger vista of business which is open to you. Mm -hmm. But what is the benefit to the academic and research community? Sorry, two or three questions packed into one. Yeah. And first, we start at the project and focused on the point that the stakeholder, stakeholder means the government, stakeholders obstacles. And we, we is focused on that. In Japan, energy security is a very uh, a priority uh, requirement after the uh, tsunami disaster. And that's a very big issue. So we, uh, water saving has uh, so many potentials to reduce uh, water saving, uh, water uh, resources requirement, uh, and also the uh, to energy savings. So we will uh, talk to the government. What uh, water saving uh, equipment spread can uh, uh, reduce the energy uh, government's uh, obstacle uh, to mitigate. To mitigate, the, we will talk to the mitigate potential. Then, so they can uh, uh, account it at the uh, cost. Uh, how, how to uh, they have the so many ideas uh, to solve the uh, problems. That, but we also uh, show the uh, one items. Uh, water saving is one one item to solve. So they can uh, they can think it, it is uh, reasonable or something. So so, uh, so uh, we we are makers. We are uh, uh, in uh, totals uh, researcher. And we also uh, collaborate with uh, the academic side. O we always uh, contact with the academic side and the joint research. And this uh, academic side do, uh, uh, channels, to use the academic side channel to propose our ideas to the government. Yeah. Okay. And uh, one other sub-question was, mm -hmm. Did you support and fund the research that was done in academia, or was it supported by the government? Who no, no, paid no. For the research? Uh, uh, total uh, uh, fee. No, okay. Not support. Yeah, we don't have the support. Fast, fast, fast. But uh, water saving is uh, useful for the uh, government's environmental uh, policy. 
So nowadays, uh, we, our project uh, for Vietnam is supported by the Ministry of Environment. The first stage, uh, our study is uh, de uh, our dependent, dependent on, on our out outcome. Your, your, yes. your own resources? Yeah, okay. yes. Okay. So that, that's a very interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, relationship between private sector mm -hmm. and the research community. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's something that we certainly need to highlight more of, mm. uh, that these kind of relationships can, uh, can actually be uh, quite beneficial to society at the end of the day. Let me do a scan. Yes, sir. Another question. Hi, I'm uh, the director of the Canary Islands Institute of Technology. So I was wondering if you know the story of the Canary Islands. Uh, dealing with the uh, uh, energy and water nexus, I will give you uh, will give a short presentation uh, in one hour. So I ask you to stay, and I will I will speak about this uh, I think successful story for approximately 10 minutes with concrete examples about uh, I think successful uh, public private collaboration uh, research area. Hmm? I, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the story. Uh, is it possible for you to give us a two-minute yeah. summary of that? <laughs> Sorry to, to push you a little bit. I know it's a very interesting story, and I think yeah. it's quite relevant to this discussion. Yeah, uh, just so we were forced in the Canary Islands. You know there is no uh, rainfall or extremely low rainfall there, uh, at least in the, the majority of the islands. So we were forced to look for unconventional water resources uh, 50 years ago. So the first desalination plants in Europe were installed in the Canary Islands, and uh, we began there to create this uh, uh, knowledge around this energy and water nexus. Water is for us energy because 80% of the water coming from the tap in the Canary Islands is uh, produced in desalination plants. And uh, uh, the research community, we as a public research institute, but also the two universities has, have helped to uh, uh, create knowledge around this uh, nexus. So one uh, uh, examples are our uh, technology transfer to African countries. So we are providing electricity and water to rural areas of Africa, of West Africa, where we are, you know, maybe you know where we are. We are very close to West Africa. And the other uh, good example uh, that uh, I will highlight this example in my presentation is the uh, uh, project of El Hierro, this small island with 10,000 people, where we have created a um, wind pumped hydro power station with a multiple water use. So we want the island to be 100% renewable. It will be the first island uh, powered entirely by uh, renewable energies. Uh, this is a difficult thing because it's not connected to, a, to the mainland, so it's a, it's a standalone system, an isolated system, where the APA reservoir has also the use of a uh, regulating uh, tank. So I will, I will uh, 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 speak about this uh, experience in 10 minutes with uh, pictures so that you know that I think we have been success successful in, this, uh, 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 in creating knowledge and experience around this nexus. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to. Thank you very much. Other comments or questions? Yes, Barbara. Oh, there was, sorry, I didn't see you. All right, I just wanted to mention the third question is on new modalities for partnerships. And um, there are actually such kind of new modalities in place and they are being tested and tried out. For example, um, the so-called learning alliance. So the learning alliance and Josefina knows it well because it was, amongst others, also tested um, in the area of integrated um, water management and one of those conferences had also taken place here, is about um, those with a common interest in solving a problem sitting together, including researchers, but including also really those that are sort of end users that are in one way or other connected with an issue around the same table, at the same level. 
and not understanding experts, only those that are sitting in the universities, because, of course, the end user in herself or himself is also an expert, because she or he knows what a particular approach, technology, uh, um, service arrangement, whatever you have, it doesn't have to necessarily be a technology, what that implies on a day-to-day -day basis, for example. So think about doing some research, for example, for providing services to these informal settlements in, in Casablanca, for example. So this is more about, uh, more than a, whatever, a, a big university and World Bank, national government and so on sitting together. This is also about making it possible for those living in these areas and then that are disadvantaged in many ways, for example, in you know, even expressing themselves and uh, expressing their needs. Um, so also making provisions for them to, to include them. So I think um, if we're really looking for new modalities for research that also have a higher guarantee of making research relevant, then we would have to uh, look into this kind of really innovative approaches. Thank you for that very interesting answer to question three. We'll take perhaps the last uh, comment or question, and then I'll come back to each of the panelists for about a 30 sec second final thought, and then I would like to close it off because we're uh, getting close to our uh, final time. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question maybe is related to, uh, to the last one. Um, you have mentioned um, the several knowledge gaps in the water and, and energy nexus, and. Uh, uh, I consider uh, this risky uh, if we try to solve these gaps uh, separately uh, among the different actors. And the question is uh, how to connect the experiences uh, of the different actors of the scientific community, the governments, the private sector, the NGOs, uh, how to connect these experiences to solve these knowledge gaps. Do you consider uh, um, we need uh, a kind of uh, partnerships between the, among the, these actors in order to solve these uh, knowledge gaps. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. So um, I, I think uh, we'll now go in reverse order, and Alberto will start with you. And if you can very briefly in a few sentences offer maybe some closing thoughts. Thank you. Um, I see a more natural way to create partnerships from the, from the energy sector into the water sector that, than the other way around. It seems to me that uh, water users um, are finding solutions outside of the standard energy business sector. And, and I mentioned uh, the example of uh, irrigation district that wanted to become completely unhooked to, to the grid in order to be energy independent. Mm -hmm. um, there, there might be reasons for that, um, um, but uh, I think uh, the energy sector is perceived, is seen as a powerful sector that imposes the conditions onto uh, the customers and, and, and it seems that at least from, from the agricultural area, uh, I see a lot of interest in becoming more independent in terms of energy use and energy uh, procuring. Um, it's also interesting that uh, in, the, in the water sector, um, you see many companies um, disseminating the idea that they're saving water. You see examples like big companies like Nestlé, uh, or many other companies are providing information about their gains in uh, water reduction in their products. Now the question is, uh, how much energy is needed for that? What, what is the, the combined effect of energy use in promoting uh, reduced water footprint? This is, for me, uh, uh, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm reiterating for, for what, I, what I said at the beginning. Uh, but we need, to com we need to, to approach both the energy and water in, in combination. Otherwise, uh, there might be um, two emphasis in one of the other at the expense of the other. And, and, and there, I, I don't see partnerships between water consumers, energy providers are becoming so easy. So, um, so this is uh, something we have to work on in the future. 
the, the, the academic uh, sector, of course, is always eager to combine the two because uh, we are just looking at ideas and, and findings. But uh, in actual context, uh, I don't see as many collaborations uh, from the energy sector into the water uh, as much as the other way. Okay, thank you. Um, Teresa san Regarding uh, standards, uh, if, if the company made standards, people think the standard is for the company's product Same. selling. So um, private sector and un university uh, academic side Collaboration is very important. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I said uh, our research-based approach is that our strategy is to show the uh, goals, to share the goal image with the uh, government and, and other stakeholders. And we also do at another one things that one is uh, to share the methodology to calculate or to, uh, yeah, to, to calculate the uh, goal, goal. So uh, we, all, we always open the uh, methodology and the results. Uh, and at the same time, we always uh, share all the data with uh, all many people, many, many stakeholders. That's uh, perhaps the successful reason for us. Thank you. John? Um, just a couple of points. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. I, we, we've been talking a lot about the research through academia and the, the money through government. I think we shouldn't forget that a lot of the research comes through private companies and venture capital. This goes a bit to the economic side, I think, that Diego was talking about. There's a lot of venture capital out there. It's a surprising amount. The guys are fairly tough about how they spend it. But a lot of them do have a kind of green agenda, and they like to see things done properly. And I think if we could sort of take that approach, which is sort of more common in the developed world, and move it to the developing world, that might be a, a, a very good thing, because it gives another dimension outside of what governments and, 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 and regular academic research is doing. They, they are, the, the private sector, to address an earlier question, has a reason for this research. They see a problem and they want to solve it. And there's probably an ROI at the end of it. Um, so to that extent, I think we also need a bit of research in how to identify, to use Malcolm Gladwell's term, the tipping points. What are the game changers here? And once you can sort of pinpoint those, and it's a lot easier said than done, I think that research gains more focus. What's going to make the difference? And finally, um, uh, to, to just use an analogy in a, in a, in a, in a, in a country where, where football is, is terrific, um, this is not an original one, but it's about policy. And I, I heard it somewhere else saying that we should let the legislators create the playing field, but then they have to leave and the, they get the politicians off it, in other words, and leave it to the players, leave it to the technical people and other people involved in it to play the game out. So they know the rules. You don't keep changing the rules. You define the area but let them play it out in their own way. And I think that was a sort of pretty good piece of advice to add a bit of stability to a situation that can change almost overnight according to political whims. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think that was a very interesting debate and very interesting feedback from the audience uh, or participants. Um, I, I think there's actually quite a lot of ideas, and, and I'm not going to try and summarize those. Uh, but I do want to share some thoughts about uh, what I think in terms of the type of research that, that uh, seems to be coming out of the categories. Uh, the, the first one is the research on these uh, economic analyses, as Diego was so eloquently uh, describing. Uh, I, I think there's a whole range of economic uh, analyses that, that can fall underneath that umbrella. The second one is the research that would motivate behavior change that behavior change could be on the part of governments or on the part of consumers or perhaps even on the part of private sector. Um, uh, but that's the, the objective of, of that type of research. And thirdly, research that would actually um, 
identify and quantify the benefits to the private sector. And, and that ties in very closely to what I just said about uh, bringing about behavioral change in, in the private sector. But that would be actually a very interesting way of uh, looking at what research achieves, that it actually is offering uh, benefits to the private sector. And I think we had a very good uh, example of that uh, presented here at the panel. And to achieve all of this research, uh, this was an excellent idea to highlight, and I think perhaps that should be one of the takeaways from the, from the conference itself to really start to build learning alliances. It would be actually even more interesting if we were to instigate such an alliance coming out from the conference itself. Um, no, I'm putting you on the spot, uh, Josefina, a little bit, but, uh, but I think that would be quite interesting. So uh, please join me in thanking the panelists for their excellent inputs. back to you. Thank you very much. Um, again, an excellent panel, and thank you for the discussion. Some of the issues seem to be coming back, no, uh, Adil, from different perspectives, so that was really useful as well. But I think you made the point in a different way on, you know, what would be the role of the science community. So thank you very much. So we are now having 15, 15 minutes coffee break. I'm really sorry about that. Only 15 minutes, and I think we are late already. So I would ask you to come back at 25 too, so we don't miss the next very exciting panel on innovation. So please come back.